Hello and welcome to The Price of Football, the show that looks at the money behind the beautiful game with me, Kevin Day, and Liverpool University's Kieran Maguire. Uh, Kieran, you may be surprised to hear that despite what producer guy thinks, we are talking about football this week. <laughs> that, was a, that was a one-off temporary ban. Um, and I've got a bone to pick with you, oh. Kieran, because there we were, the half-time whistle went at Sellers Park. We just played arguably the best half of football we played uh, in the Premier League, I would say. We were fantastic. And then we got into the bar thinking, oh, I've got to go near above Chelsea. And, and it was ruined by the fact that you were 3 nil up at half-time. It's not, it's, even even then, Kieran, you ruined our Saturday. But what a result for you. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Um, only uh, only tempered by the fact that uh, Todd Bowley is now trying to sign OG from us, um, which is <laughs> disappointing. <laughs> yeah, and, and anything that we're successful at, he wants. Uh, that, I could, we couldn't decide at half time whether it made it better or worse that two of them were own goals. But there you go. <laughs> Bless him. You couldn't. It, 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 oh, yeah, it, you must. Your sense of Schadenfreude must have been very strong, Gary. Oh yes, oh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, I would say, how's the head? But you don't drink. So how how do you celebrate? What did you have? An extra pie? Another dollar um, clean one? Oh yeah, we we went for a an, an extra large curry myself and the Baroness afterwards, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, and, and then of course, able to watch match of the day. Fantastic. First, I, I, I barely recognise Gary Lineker. It's nice to see him again, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. um, it's, it's questions day, Kieran. We have yes. a lot of questions today, and they're good questions. Uh, and some of them are perfect for you, so you'll be in spreadsheet heaven. Um, our first question comes from Glenn Entwistle, and Glenn says, I've been reading through the accounts for Blackburn Rovers. So you've started a trend, Kieran. What people, have I done? What people, have I are done? Doing, people are doing it for relaxation. You're, you're, there's going to be marriages breaking up all over the... Uh, and Glenn's been reading through the accounts of Blackburn Rovers, and he says two things jumped out at me. Firstly, the money for the training centre sale to the owners won't go through until the 30th of June 2023, which mm-hmm. is over two years after it appeared in the books. Secondly, Rovers have entered into a lease for the use of the training centre, which appears to be for £415,000 a year. Should we be delay, worried about the delay in the settlement of the purchase? And is it not counterproductive to charge rent back to the club after buying the training centre to help with profit and sustainability rules? Yes. Uh, well, the points you raise, Glenn, are, are valid ones. The whole reason why the uh, training facility was sold in the first place would, was that without it, Blackburn would have been in breach of FFP mm. rules. So we've seen this at Reading, Sheffield Wednesday, uh, Villa, uh, Derby, uh, and, and Blackburn um, until uh, until I think it was June twenty one. Um, those profits were allowed to be included in your FFP calculations, and from the first of uh, July 2021, the rules were changed and you wouldn't have been able to do it. So that's why we saw Stoke sell uh, their ground to, um, I can't remember what it was, was it Bet365, I believe, who, uh, who bought the Bet365 Stadium mm. um, at, at, a, at a very, very generous price, uh, completely, completely above board, just before the 30th of June. Blackburn effectively did the same. So because uh, clubs were aware that the rules were changing, they therefore accelerated the sales. Um, in terms of the cash not turning up until 2023, um, that that is the case. I, I've got to be honest. Um, the the cash is coming from the Venkies, so it's effectively the Venkies taking money out of one pocket and sticking it into another. So I, I don't see that as being an issue. Um, and Blackburn are also getting four percent interest um, on the delay in payment, which offsets the rent that they are paying. So. Um, this is all sort of driven by a desire to comply with the, the profitability and sustainability rules. So from that point of view, should you be worrying? No. I mean, you know, the, the main concern as far as Blackburn uh, are at present, um, and they're having a fantastic season, by the way, is that um, you know, no Venkies, no party. Uh, and, and I know the Venkies initially were... Uh, fairly controversial owners. They they didn't appear to have done any due diligence. They they weren't aware of the existence of relegation. So therefore, it came as quite a shock to them because they bought Blackburn as a as a Premier League club. Um, they have actually been uh, pretty generous owners, and 
without their benevolence, um, Blackburn wouldn't be at the, the top end of the championship today. Yeah, I remember being at Blackburn when there was a, a protest against the Venkies uh, in which several chickens were released onto the pitch, <laughs> which which begged quite a few questions. A, about the stewards outside and their searching of the people going into the ground, because you, 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 you can't really tuck a t- chicken into your pocket, can you? Um, and B, the stewarding inside, because there's nothing funnier than seeing several overweight, perspiring stewards running around the football pitch trying to get hold of a chicken that didn't want to be caught. Um, I also love it when you say completely above board, Kieran, because you you always put inverted commas around it. I don't know how you managed to do that. Um, our next question comes from Ronif Nair. Uh, and you can fill your boots on this one, Kieran, because it's about Chelsea. Basically. Um, and Ronif, uh, his question, uh, basically, Roman Abramovich bought Chelsea for around £150 million in 2003 and subsequently loaned around £1.5 billion to the club over the next 20 or so years. Adjusted for inflation, how much did he actually invest into Chelsea in total? Um, Well, adjusting for inflation, he made a net profit of uh, around about 400 million. So that means his his total investment came to just over 2 billion um, into the club. I think there's there's still a, a bit of an issue in relation to the sale of Chelsea in that there appears to be a news blackout as to what has happened to the money. You know, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine at the start of March or end yeah. of February. Uh, the club was sold by the end of May, and we were told at the time the money was going to be ring fenced. The money was going to be uh, given to good causes to to try to assist uh, you know, the, the people of Ukraine in terms of what they're having to uh, undertake. Uh, you know, trying to defend their country against Putin's uh, aggressors. And there's no sign of anything. So, you know, if if the government is involved in here in this, why have they gone completely quiet? Where where is the where is the news in relation to it? Two and a half billion pounds is a lot of money. It can make a difference uh, in terms of being able to give humanitarian aid to to try to assist these people who are going through uh, you know, a a horrendous uh, experience at present through no fault of their own. Yeah, it, it, interestingly, Kieran, we have a guest on, I don't think it's next week, the week after, who has done a study into the finances of Ukrainian football since mm. the invasion. So that's a question maybe we can put to them because, as you say, it would be a substantial amount of money and it would really help the people of Ukraine. But So you say that he made 400 million profits. So Abramovich, despite all the money he spent on Chelsea, was still making... £20 million profit a year? Well, only in the sense that the value of Chelsea as a club was growing all the time. Uh, You know, he he effectively, um, he effectively rode the wave. Uh, The the, the Premier League became increasingly popular. Chelsea, because he was able to buy success at the club, and that's not taking away from the talents of the players or the coaches, but if you take a look at Chelsea, Chelsea have got the biggest wage bill in the history of the Premier League. Mm-hmm. And and you know, £1.5 billion of that came through Abramovich's own pockets. So um, he, he was able to, to benefit from that in the sense that the value of Chelsea increased and increased. I, I still think that the, the price that they, they generated from the sale of the club was beyond expectations. But yeah, ultimately, you're playing for a trophy asset. You're paying for a unique asset. Um, Bowley and Clearlake, and you, you know my views on Bowley. Uh, there's things I can't say and I won't say on the show. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they, they've come in and, and they've carried on spending the cash. Uh, but it, it's he, he if he had sold it in a business transaction, he would have made a profit of 400 million. Mm. It's a shame you won't say them on the show, Kieran, because you said them just before the show this morning and remarkably entertaining they were too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and full of a couple of swear words I don't think I've ever heard before. Um, <laughs> I think you went into Gaelic at one stage. Uh, our next question is from Adam Wagman. Now, I hope, Adam, and please let me know if this is true, I hope Adam is related to the legendary Mark Wagman, a.k.a. Waggers, who is the celebrity booker for ITV and the source of the best showbiz gossip you'll ever hear in your life. Um, 
<laughs> so Adam, let me know if you are related to Mark and please send me my regards and thank him for the story about Beyonce. Um, Adam Wagman's <laughs> question. <laughs> Adam Wagman's question is, I hope you are both well. First of all, I just want to say that I absolutely love the podcast. Thank you, Adam. So much so that I'm now in training to be a chartered accountant. Jesus. No, no, no. <laughs> there, there was Adam, happily enjoying his young life, looking forward to a, a career in <laughs> rock music. <laughs> he listens to one pod, and now he's going to be a chartered accountant. My question is, how is the sale of football players treated from a tax perspective? Is it simply the total net profit taxed at the standard rate of corporation tax in the country, or are there special rules given that the asset is a person, um, which is something we we often overlook, the, the asset is a person, Kieran, isn't it? Especially when we're talking about young players. Okay, the asset is not a person. Uh, right. For tax purposes, because what is uh, a, a a transfer fee is in fact a compensation fee. When you sign a player on a four year contract, uh, his or her a registration is lodged with the football association. Um, if you want to uh, rip up that registration certificate, which is which is a contract. Um, then you can either do so voluntarily or you can do so because somebody gives you enough money to make you want to do that. So if we take the case of Mark Kukurea, okay? Mm. Um, and yeah, in, <laughs> yeah. Ter- in terms of in terms of yesterday, and I, sus- I suspect this might get cut out by producer guy, um, uh, the, fact, the fact that Connor Gallagher wasn't the biggest floppy-haired twat at the, at the Amex <laughs> yesterday <laughs> was, was quite an achievement. <laughs> um, and we gave Kukurea, uh, it, you know, pe- people have spoken about the abuse given to, to Potter. It, it, it wasn't directed at Potter, it was directed at the Chelsea owners. Uh, yeah. In the case of Kukurea, I have never seen somebody visibly shrink um, because he, he had to, he had to get, he was doing throw-ins, and every time he got near the ball, it was it, it was like banshee whales uh, attacking <laughs> him, um, and, and that's 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 why we love football. It's pantomime. You know, it's it's not real. He's picking up one hundred and fifty grand a week, so you know he's he's, he's he, he will he will cope with it. Um, but he, he had, he had an absolutely terrible game was substituted and then made the mistake of walking around the perimeter of the ground to get to the uh, to get to the, the box. So it was a. Uh, if, if we take his if we take his contract, he signed a five year contract in good faith. Um, just over twelve months ago, um, Chelsea wanted to uh, take his employment. He he went on effectively went on strike, and and that's why he got the abuse. Not, it wasn't the transfer; it was the oh, I'm I'm I've, I'm not going to train very hard. Yes, it's, it's all the sort of the things that players do. So so um, so Chelsea said to Brighton, um, we we would like his registration, and Brighton said, well, he's got four years remaining on his certificate, so. What are you going to do about it? Chelsea said, we will give you £62.6 million. And when we finished laughing, we said, yeah, OK, we'll take it. I, I, I was just thinking the idea of a banshee whale for Halloween. That's, I know you were talking about W-A-I-L, but a banshee whale. My, um, my Uncle Donny in Donegal once claimed that he went for a drink with a banshee, uh, <laughs> that he heard the banshee whale and he was so cross about the fact that he might die. He saw, he found the source of the Banshee whale, well, took it for a drink, and uh, the Banshee promised. He also claimed that he rescued a mermaid once. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I suspect he was probably pulling our leg, Kieran. Well, not the mermaid, obviously. Well, not the yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for that question, Adam. Um, and good luck with your chartered accountant career. Um, Louise Roberts has our next question. Louise says, I'm a Brentford fan and an avid listener of the podcast. Thank you, Louise. Since being promoted to the Premier League, I've noticed that Brentford have announced a series of new contract extensions. Given that we generally make sensible financial decisions and player sales is a large part of our business model, is this good business, given these will likely be Premier League contracts on inflated salaries? And is the timing of these contract extensions significant? Um, I think, Louise, these are uh, good things for... For all of the stakeholders, as far as the contract extension is concerned, so you've got the player, you've got the club, and you've got the agent. For the player, um, it, it does give the player security. So you know, we 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 saw recently. I don't want to talk about Brighton all the time, but you know, Enoch and Wepu, he uh, he signed a four year contract when he joined the club. If, Eighteen months later, he's he's having to retire due to due to a medical condition. So he now has some protection for the remainder of his contract, and and, and yeah, the details of that, of course, are private. Um, 
And so so the player is is protected for an extended number of years in terms of guaranteed revenue, uh, guaranteed income. The the contract extension almost always uh yeah if, if a player i would say is is under the age of 30 to 32 that contract extension tends to coincide with the pay rise as well so so the, the player benefits from security and increased revenue from the club's point of view by getting a player to sign a contract extension it reduces the ability of the player to to leave on a Bosman because yep. if you sign a four year, four year contract, you get they've been there for three years, they've been half decent. You're now starting to get squeaky bum time. You know the, the player could either sit out that final twelve months. You know and and you know, I, people say well players will just go through the motions. Players don't because they they know they'll get dropped. And also you don't want to go and set yourself a reputation as a player that only turns it on when. You know, at the early years of a contract but also from the club's point of view when you get into you know, that position where a player's got 12 months remaining on the contract the value of the compensation fee and and, and this is going back to to adam's uh question that we've just been looking at. and and in terms of this and I, I didn't mention in terms of tax it's just treated as the the sale of an intangible asset like all other intangible assets so subject to normal corporation tax so from the club's point of view what they don't have to uh suffer in that in that last 12 months is you'd, you'd probably look at a you know a 15 20 25 percent reduction in the player value or the transfer value because clubs will buying clubs will say well okay we're, we're prepared to sit it out for 12 months so therefore we're prepared to offer you a lower fee so so there's benefits to the club there's benefits to the player the agent will have negotiated on behalf of the player so the agent will will get a commission as well um and, and provided the player turns out to be okay then then that's good but you know what happens if you know arsenal with ozil arsenal with obamayang you know we we've seen players get towards that that last 12 months there's pressure from the fans because the player is a fan's favorite and is delivered and then the contract extension comes along and for whatever reason the player's form deteriorates you know that's when that's when the club can lose out yeah, just for the benefit of newer listeners, Kieran, or, or listeners who may not be completely aware, can you just briefly explain what you mean by doing a Bosman? Yeah, the, the, the under um, under a court case in nineteen ninety five, I think it was. Yeah. Um, the Jean Luc Bosman was a Belgian player who had a contract at uh, Standard Liège. Standard Liège, like yeah. yeah, Standard Liège, and um, his contract expired. And the club said, we want to uh, re-employ you, but on worse terms. Yeah. And he said, well, I don't think that's very reasonable, but he didn't have a choice. Un- under the rules at the time, uh, as far as the football industry was concerned, you were effectively a tied labourer. And it was only when the club deigned to uh, terminate the contract that you could actually go and find employment elsewhere. So therefore, he, uh, he put in a legal claim. Um, which was successful, which effectively said that at the expiry of a contract between player and club, the player was entitled to move uh, to find alternative employment and no compensation um, was required. And and therefore, the player could effectively move on a free transfer. And and we've seen players start to exploit this at at the elite level. So uh, Pogba moved from Manchester United to Juventus for nothing on a huge wage. We saw Ibrahimovic come to Manchester United effectively on a Bosman a couple of years ago. He got a huge salary. Um, In the case of Kylian Mbappe, his contract expired in the summer and he was effectively able to go around to Real Madrid and his current employer and says, well, okay, there's no transfer transfer fee involved here I think I deserve a bit more compensation and he got it was, it's estimated to be 150 million pounds signing on fee plus a pretty tasty uh, wage on top of that yeah I'm, I'm going to go for John Mark Bosman so oh, yeah. Be- yeah. between between the two of us I think we've got it we'll have got it right unfortunately some people have already tweeted after they heard you've have you been watching Star Trek again Kieran have you been celebrating <laughs> um, our next question is a rather plaintive one, and it comes from Robert Whittaker. Uh, Robert says, now that Scunthorpe United have been relegated from the Football League, could you cast some light over just how much of an existential threat Scunny are under? As I understand it, the club has crippling debts. An owner who stood down as chairman but not distanced himself from the money the club owes him, and the club's future at Glanford Park is uncertain as well. 
Yes. Um, so Scunthorpe, uh, yeah, I, I can remember Scunthorpe in the Championship. They are yeah. now yeah. at the at the wrong end of the National League. National yeah. League really competitive. Some of the crowds that are being generated in the National League this season uh, are absolutely incredible. And and for those people who are feeling a bit half hearted about the World Cup. Go and find your, na- your nearest you know, grassroots football or national yeah. league team and go and watch them. You yeah. will have a great day out, um, and it's cheaper. Um, but back back to the position of Scunthorpe. Um, Scunthorpe are effectively owned by a gentleman called Peter Swan. Uh, he uh, He's a nightclub owner. He's a property developer. He's involved in racehorses, uh, I believe so as well. And um, under Mr. Swan... Um, on an operational level, Scunthorpe have lost sixty thousand pounds a week for, for for nine years, coming on ten years. Wow! Um, so yeah, that that's a lot uh, to have to deal with. And to give Mister Swan some credit, he's he's effectively underwritten those uh, those losses, but that's not coincided with success um, on the pitch, and that leads to fan unhappiness. So he's been subject to you know a, a, a bit of stick. You know, a few pantomime boos, shall we say, on occasion. Um, now, in, in respect of Scunthorpe's ground, Glanford Park, um, that was sold to Cool Silk, which is Peter Swan's company, uh, about a year ago. Um, and, and that effectively was in lieu of him collecting some of the money which was due to him. Um, I, I think there are uh, there's, there's a degree of concern amongst Scunthorpe fans because... Uh, Peter Swan wants to convert the car park, which he, which his uh, company calls it, you know, owns. I think it's into 140 apartments or something like that. Yeah. So, so you know, you you in in terms of things which get us twitchy, to, in terms of red flags, separation of club from stadium, property developer, you know, these these things always people make feel a little bit uncomfortable. Peter Swan did step down as a director of the club. He says, I'm not involved in terms of its day-to-day activities. He did that around about six months ago. And then in July 2022, um, and this is according to the Grimsby Telegraph, I believe, he said he'd agreed a price um, with prospective owners. You know, and it had it was it was one of those open secrets in football that, that Scunthorpe was up for sale. Um, and that was in July. He says, you have agreed a price with an owner, can't reveal the name because we signed non-disclosure agreements. All, all that, that seemed quite reasonable. Um, and, and then it's all gone very quiet. Um, and you know, then, then the rumour mill starts. So yeah. you know, is there a danger of the club going into administration? Um, I, I've, I've heard stories. I, I cannot give them any credibility or give them any or, – or, Dismiss them. You know, it's it's that that sort of you know abstract position that we're in. In fact, I've, I've been in contact with some people from Scunthorpe this week, um, not not Scunthorpe Football Club, but some people I know uh, who who are Scunthorpe fans, and you know they're, they're getting frustrated. And you know, if you've agreed a sale, then then why hasn't it gone through? And it tends to come down to the small print. It come it comes down to the money. So is is Peter Swan hanging out for more money? We don't know. Have the uh, prospective owners? As a result of their due diligence, have they lifted the carpet and they've not liked what they've seen, as can be the case. And remember when we spoke to um, when, when we spoke to the, the Jags Trust in respect to, of Partick Thistle with the ludicrous situation of, of that club uh, where the people in control say, yeah, we'll, we'll give you the club, but we're not, we're not telling you what you're buying, which, yeah. Was, yeah, which yeah. is ridiculously unprofessional. Um, and, and we've not heard from Partick. Yeah, we'd, we'd put out an open offer. Uh, we're not disappointing that we've not heard from the club itself. So existential threat, um, no. Um, is is the club's future? Can, can I put a cast iron guarantee that there's absolutely nothing to worry about? I, I can't say that either. So it's it, it's twitchy, but it's not it's not terminal. Is what I would say. What would you expect to pay for Scunthorpe United? Well, you, yeah, it's it's an it's a non-league club. It's it's got a bit of well, it hasn't got any property. Um, so you know, is it a case of buying it for a pound and a, and and taking over all the responsibility of the liabilities? That could be the case, or is it a case of the new owners coming in and buying the the property assets and the rest of the football club? In which case, I think you know, it, there would be a few million. Um, 
is is it worth the eleven million that I think the the, the ground was sold for? I'm, I'm not convinced of that either. Right. Our next question comes from Villa Lagerstedt. Uh, Villa says, "Is it a positive thing that UEFA now limits player wages to seventy percent of club income? You often mention clubs from the Championship spending a lot more than they earn. So will this rule make clubs more sustainable?" Um. Is it a good thing? I, I think I think we have to go sort of go back one step and say, what exactly do we want in respect of football? Because if you want a game where the priority is to be sustainable, um, then it could be argued that the new financial and sustainability rules as brought in by UEFA, and, and people not familiar with those rules, what they've done is that they've said that, that this season – player wages and agent fees um, cannot exceed 90% of revenue. That drops to 80% next season, and then it's going to go forward at 70%. Um, So this is what we sometimes refer to as a soft wage cap. Um, That does have some merit. It also has some demerit. If you are a club such as uh, you know, Manchester United, Manchester City, Chelsea, yeah, you know, the, you know, the big six. On average, their revenue is is around about 450, 500 million. So 70% of that means that they can spend 350 million on wages. If you've then got an ambitious club such as Newcastle, whose revenue is, say, closer to, to 180 million, you get 70% of that, and, and that limits your wage bill to, yeah, what, 145 million or so. So it means that they've got less than half the wage budget of, uh, of, of the big six, and it makes it that much more difficult. So it locks in the existing closed shop. And, and people say, well, you know, why am I using phrases like this? If you take a look at the, the clubs that have qualified for the Champions League over the last decade, with the exception of Leicester, it's it's all been from the usual suspects. It's yeah. all been from the, the Super League clubs. So so that's that's the that's the downside of having a soft wage cap. Um it will reduce some of the financial excess in terms of money being spent. It will mean that the the opportunity for somebody new to threaten the existing elite becomes increasingly difficult. And we know that you know, the owners of Villa are keen to do that. If the 49ers, 49ers take over Leeds, you know, could Leeds do that? Because Leeds, you know, we know that Villa and Leeds and Newcastle, they're all big clubs. They all have got the... The, the the capacity in terms of a fan base certainly domestically to be challenging and you and I Kevin you know, we remember Derby County Forest Villa Blackburn Everton all yep. winning the top division we remember Leeds winning it um and the the sort of the mentality these days that the big six have a god-given right to fight amongst themselves for the trophies is, is is a narrative which I always feel very uncomfortable with. You know, when when Ipswich were runners up, and you you, you can remember that, and you know, under Bobby Robson, those, those were those were QPR. Um, yeah. Yeah, those were genuinely exciting days yeah. for everybody in football, as opposed to just a protected elite. Well, increasingly as well, it's not even six clubs, is it? It's it's two clubs essentially mm. that are fighting it out. Our next question comes from Sam Bates. Um, and Sam knows how to get a question answered because he starts by saying, love the show. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> the show loves you back. Although Sam says, as an accountant myself, it can be a bit of a busman's holiday to listen to in my morning walk or run. But always informative. You'll get that BAFTA one day. That's the sort of fighting talk we need. Thank you, Sam. Yes. My question is, can Kieran go into more detail about how he calculated Premier League inflation? I saw him name checked on a YouTube video showing that Alan Shearer to Newcastle would have cost £222 million today. How was this index created? Was it based purely on rising TV revenue or were players of similar statistical quality and age benchmarked over the years? Right. Um, well, thanks very much, Sam. Um, this this originally came about because I was contacted by Alex K. Jelski, uh, who's the editor of The Athletic, and he said... They wanted to work out some form of player calculator, and, and could I help? So, um, what, what I had to do this is, is I 
I did it on the basis of if we've we just taken a look at the, the consumer prices index since 1992 um, and factored that in um, the consumer prices index, um, which represents uh, you know, prices for us as as punters. That's risen by 98 percent uh, between 1992 and 2022. Um But we know that football has expanded as an industry. So what I did is I got every single set of accounts for every single club that has played in the Premier League from 1992 to 2022, uh, as well as their wage bills. And I I stuck those all onto a giant spreadsheet. Um, And then it was possible to work out what we might refer to as football inflation. Um, And under this, um, we have a football inflation based on uh, and – Sam you know, refers to increases in income. So if it's based on increases in income, it worked out as just over 2,800%. And if it's based on player wages, uh, player wages have actually risen not just faster than retail prices, but faster than football inflation. Player wages have gone up by 3,200%. So wow. I put that into, yeah, I put this into a, you know, a, a big website. Uh, and then I'm indebted, uh, whilst, I'm, whilst I'm quite good at digging out data, and and I've and I've got the patience of uh, of, of Finley waiting for a wonky trump. Um, <laughs> I, I'm I'm not actually very good at Excel itself. I'm, I'm not very. I wouldn't call myself a spreadsheet whiz. So um, I, I've got a colleague, uh, Jason Laws, at the University of Liverpool, and, and Jason is uh, is a a huge Sunderland fan, but B he is an Excel god. So um, together, uh, myself and Jason, we created the Maguire Laws Index. And we we put this into a, a framework and we sent it off to the athletic and said, this is how you can do it. And then their individual uh, sort of club uh, reporters, they said, well, we're going to pick half a dozen players, are you iconic players from our team over the years and how much would it cost today? And, and that allowed them to work out the, the 222 million for Alan Shearer and so on. So I, I noticed that he did all the hard work, Kieran, the Excel god, but it was still your name at the start of the index. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the Maguire laws. Um, yeah, I, I know we're not here to plug other products. Horrible word, um, but Dominic Firefield, uh, who's a journalist I know and admire very much, wrote a fantastic piece about Ian Wright uh, when he joined Palace uh, on the Athletic recently. I, Palace fans, any football fans, should, should search that out. Dave Moore has a question about vloggers. Uh, Dave says pretty much every club now has their own individual or groups of vloggers who are making content on YouTube at certain levels, presumably based on number of views and possibly even making money from advertising as well. Is this something that clubs would look to gate crash as it is potentially a revenue stream for them? Uh, well, it, it certainly is a lucrative uh, endeavour for those people involved. Um, and yeah, I, I think we're, we're you know the, the, some of the people involved. You, you think about Arsenal TV. Yeah. Um, whilst it's sort of shock jock, uh, you know, for for Generation Z, um, I believe, um, content it, it works. You know, people people tend to tune in when Arsenal lose. Yeah. So. so so therefore, yesterday uh, when, when this question came in, I thought I'd check out Chelsea fans TV, <laughs> uh, pure, purely for research purposes. Um, and yeah, and, and and they've got it. Um, and yeah, you know, it's it's quite often you'll you it's it can be a variety of ways of delivering the product. So sometimes you will have a a fan who will you know, take their phone with them, and it's you know, walking up to the ground, talking through what happened during the 90 minutes uh, Chelsea lost 4-1 by the way um and, <laughs> and 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 getting views on the back of that um it can be more independent it can be studio based as well so i i quite often appear on something called stretford paddock which is a manchester united um vlog um and, and it is incredibly professional um yeah. and, and yeah. the viewing figures that they get um, what I suspect make individual clubs go a bit green at the gills. The reason why they're popular is because they are independent. So it's taking that fanzine mentality and philosophy, the ability to be critical of the club. Now, would the clubs like to be able to do that themselves? Well, you know, there is Manchester United, there is Manchester United TV, there is Chelsea TV. You will get the the corporate 
um, YouTube clips and interviews, which which are unique. You know, the, you know, the club clearly has access to the players and the and the managers in, in a much uh, easier way than than the vloggers will, if, if at all. Um, but it does come across as very corporate, very anodyne, spectacularly dull um, as well. So, so in in terms of generating revenue. Is it an opportunity for clubs? Yes. But the one thing which makes people want to view these things, which is independent analysis, the agony and the ecstasy, as well as the joy of being a football fan, all that would have been filtered out because you know, the press office or the, you know, the, the board of directors, so, well, you can't say that about the club, you can't say that about us. And, and by the time that they get out there, their their red red pen and cross things out. You're 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 left with with nothing to report um, from the match apart from you know the players are media trained to say nothing in as many words as possible until the interviews over. Over um, managers have done managers do exactly the same. Um, you know, the, the reason why why this show is is reasonably successful is because we are independent and you know we we have had offers from institutions to buy us out and we've always said thanks but no thanks because we quite like the idea of having full editorial control which we would lose under those circumstances yeah uh, i have to say because uh, i know one of the chaps who who runs it listens to our pod but i love i love palace tv palace tv is brilliant there's no other way i'd find out what joel ward's favorite pasta is <laughs> palace tv wouldn't it? i did just too much research involved but i put palace tv on and i can find out whether or not he's happy or unhappy after a 3-0 defeat away it's very good robert mcpherson says i hear you often saying how scottish football teams have run quite well i was wondering if my team ross county might be the exception as far as i'm aware our magnificent owner funds a club to the tune of a million pound plus a year so what happens when he inevitably moves on um, yes, I think you've got ex- you've got a very good point here, um, Andrew. I, I Robert, I, sorry, Robert, I'm 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 losing losing track. Sorry, Robert, you you've got a keen one hangover. That's what you've got. I, I have yes. <laughs> um, as far as Ross County are concerned, they they do live beyond their means as far on an operational level, um, and yet they always break even. And, and the reason for this is, is that the club owner um, has lent the club money, and then what he does every year is say, um, I'm going to write off a, a million pounds worth of my loan, which and, and their, their operational losses are around about a million per year. So they, they are trying to compete with a bigger budget than than would independently be allowed um is it a case of the club would have to change when when the owner changes i, I think i think that is a case but but that is always the case you know yeah yeah you know, we, we we are both indebted at our clubs to to fans who happen to be independently wealthy coming in and putting money into the club at the start of that that, that relationship if if we, you then get taken over by an american private equity fund uh, their their return on investment is financial, whereas that of Steve Parrish and Tony Bloom is emotional, and, and therefore they've been willing to to you know stick their hands in their pocket at times when necessary. Yeah, uh, I, Robert's just expressing the fear of a lot of fans, isn't he? As you say, mm, that, yeah, that absolutely. The current only moves on. A uh, final question comes from Andrew Carruthers, uh, and Andrew says, "Is it only the Saturday three pm blackout?" that's stopping the Premier League from bidding off the Sky and BT deals and launching their own worldwide streaming app. We were talking about this the other night, and some quick Googling, the back of a beer map calculations, suggests they can make far more money going it alone. He's, he's, uh, Andrew says, excuse my rough calculations, and I hope my figures are correct, but uh, Premier League worldwide TV deals combined was $9.1 billion over three years, so $3.03 billion per year. Mm-hmm. Let's conservatively say they got 10 million, pound, 10 million worldwide subscribers at £45 a month, then they would get £5.4 billion pound a year. At £30 a month, they would still get £3.6 billion a year. I hope my maths are correct. Well, yeah, firstly, uh, Andrew, yeah, uh, big big tick in terms of, of crunching the numbers. Um, I, I think the issue that you've you've raised there um, is an interesting one, and it's certainly something which has been spoken about um, as far as the Premier League themselves are concerned. So, you know, there's been talk um, there's been talk about you know, Premflix or, or something 
similar. Um, I think the big challenge for the Premier League is firstly, the relationship that they already have with Sky, BT, Amazon and the BBC is is a very positive one. The, the quality of the broadcasts is good. The quality of the punditry, I know some people don't like it, but yeah, I, I think in the main is is, is pretty good. And you know, again, again, we've got our we've got our bespoke pantomime villains um, in in the in the, in the punditry, just as we have on the pitch. Um, as far as having a worldwide streaming app, there is already an issue as far as broadcasting is concerned. Um, I, I I saw from the Financial Times the other day um, that. Sky's subscriber base has is starting to decline. Um, yeah. yeah, and that's on the basis of the last quarter. Well, why is that the case? Um, there's there's a much broader issue in in terms of people suffering an economic squeeze. Um, broad, uh, football football on TV on a subscription basis, it's a luxury. And and if you and if you are if it's a case of heating the house or, or having Sky and BT, then then you, then you get rid of the TV channels. So so there, there is there is a decline now. You know, those figures that I quoted were from Europe. They weren't necessarily from the UK itself. But I'm I, I'm I'm aware anecdotally talking to people, and also I was actually quite surprised at the reaction that that came on social media of the number of people who said I can't afford to do it. Yeah. And I know myself, I've, I've cancelled my BT subscription because I simply did the sums and say I don't think I'm getting value for money. So so you know, I think there is an issue. There's the issue of price. Um, you know, the the subscription fees have gone up and up and up, much faster than general inflation. Not as fast as um, you know some of the numbers I was quoting in respect of uh, of overall uh, Premier League uh, you know inflation, but uh, it, it is becoming increasingly expensive to to have subscriptions. And uh, and uh, yeah, we're not condoning this, but we have to be honest. There are alternatives yeah. to the legitimate ways of watching television um, uh, when it comes to football, which is being shown live. And again, anecdotally, all I was, and, and this, and this was the I can show you, this was not the reason I did it. I did it because of the report in the Financial Times. The number of people that said I've, I've gone IPTV. You know, people are getting yeah. getting sticks, and everybody knows. Big Dave down the pub who knows another guy who knows another guy who can get you this. It's illegal, okay? It is illegal. The Premier League have those rights. Um, but there, there is a view taken, and it is not a view that I subscribe to or sharing. Um, there's a view taken. Well, effectively, it's a victimless crime. The players make an absolute fortune out of the game. Many owners are making a fortune out of the game. The TV companies are making a fortune out of the game. So why not go and go and pay x for this stick and i'm paying a lot less so I, I think there is a a challenge for the premier league and there's a challenge for the broadcasters as well um, and we saw this you know you and i again we, we go back to when um when, when you used to be able to go and stream music from the internet illegally and people started doing it and then the 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 production companies and the likes of uh, Spotify came along and they offered you something at a price where people said, well, actually, I, I don't mind paying seven ninety nine a month for my music. Um, and, and what we saw was the likes of Napster effectively decreased in terms of popularity. I know it's still you know the, the alternatives to that are still available, but streaming at the right price will get a, a a large number of people so in in respect of of the issue here the premier league's got to get the price right you know, 45 pounds a month when you've got amazon prime and netflix and disney and all, all the rest um and remember that's that's just for football so what happens if you if you're also a rugby fan you're also a cricket fan you also like yeah. f1 so, so it, it 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 does look like a, a cost which is perhaps too high if it's a tenner a month, if it's yeah, you know, ten, twelve pounds a month, I think people would pay it. Um, but it would involve in the short term a hit and also risk. The Premier League has no experience of running a, a TV organization. What I think we might see, um, and this is this is a lot of conjecture, is at present there are three hundred and eighty Premier League TV games taking place live each year of which 200 are used for uh, broadcast purposes to be shown live. Now, could the Premier League say, 
as an experiment, what we're going to do, we're going to sell ourselves another package of, say, 60 or 80 games, and we're going to use that to, to find our feet with regards to what works and doesn't work. And then if that is successful, then when the next set of negotiations take place, and here we we're probably looking around about 2028, um, the Premier League say, right, okay, we've we've found out what works and doesn't work. We're now going to to have our own bespoke product for all 380 games, and um, it could make its money that way. But it does carry an element of risk. You know, from from the club's point of view, what they get with the relationships with with Sky and BT and Amazon and BBC, they get certainty in terms of numbers. And if you're signing players on four or five year contracts, you want as much certainty as possible. I suppose as well, though, Kieran, there are those people who say that the more likely um, outcome, rather than the Premier League negotiating their own TV deal, is that it will be clubs that do it. You know, clubs like Liverpool and Man United will probably mm-hmm. consider in, in five, ten years' time that they can make more money out of streaming their own games than they could out of sharing 20 clubs streaming their games. Well, th- this was, in fact, part of Project Big Picture. Yeah. And this is where I think there was an awful lot of naivety from some of the people who were acting as cheerleaders for the Glazers and, and FSG. That under Project Big Picture, clubs would have been allowed to sell, I think it was eight home games each, um, direct to consumer. Um, and then the remaining monies would have been split 75% to the Premier League and 25% to the EFL. The trouble is, let's be honest, if if you were in charge of Palace and you could sell eight home games direct to the consumer, who are the opponents going to be? It's going to be you know, two Manchester clubs, Liverpool, Arsenal, Spurs, Chelsea, probably the Brighton game as well because you know, yeah. so on. Um, and, and if every club does that, what does it mean that the that the Premier League itself would be available to sell to Sky? It would be, and no disrespect to the clubs involved, it would be Bournemouth versus Wolves. It would be Leicester versus Brighton. And you go, well, you know, we know where we all know where we are in the pecking order. You're you're not going to be getting three billion a year for for flogging those rights because they they simply not worth it. And therefore. The Premier League clubs would have got 75% of a much, much smaller pie. And yes, the EFL would get 25%, but they get 25% of square root of nothing because you know, the, the pie, there's, there's two issues uh, in relation to, to any form of distribution. There's the size of the pie and it's and how you cut the pie. Uh, and it's no point taking a bigger slice if, if the pie itself is, is only a tiny fraction of its original value. Yeah, <clears throat> if I was in charge of Palace, I wouldn't bother myself with broadcasting I'd let somebody else sort that out Kieran I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd change the kit back to Claret and Blue and then pretty much lie back and enjoy the rest of the season uh, thank you to everyone who's donated to the pod via our Patreon page if you'd like to make a small monthly contribution to the pod as well that would be very kind of you and you can go to patreon.com slash price of football if you have a question you'd like answered on the show email us at questions at price of football.com we shall be back on Thursday with our normal news pod and in the meantime I shall hand you over to Mr Kieran Maguire for his customary farewell. Um, well, thanks as always, folks. And uh, also thank you to um, the people from the uh, National League Club who contacted me, and, and you know who you are. Um, I, I made an error in, in a recent show. I said I thought that most uh, National League North clubs had, had gone pro, and I was wrong. There's only yeah. three of them. So, yeah. so, so, so you know, uh, again, it's, it's, good, it's good to keep us on our toes, and we will always hold our hands up, um, and, and we will apologise. Unlike Graham Potter. Um, so, <laughs> it's, um, um, I wonder what Graham Potter's views on an independent regulator are, Kieran. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so if you want to support the club, Patreon is one fantastic way of doing that. Uh, another way is uh, this show is going out on the 31st of October. That's the final day in which you can vote in the Football Supporters uh, awards football supporters association awards we have been nominated for podcast of the year we don't quite know why but we're we're very proud and very grateful of all the same of, of making that shortlist so that's one way of doing that um, another way is to go on to your app as uh which you use to download the podcast and, and you can give us five stars it helps us in the charts helps us with algorithms all that type of nonsense um, and it doesn't matter what you say you could even say you'd rather have it produced as it is halloween by the Count from Sesame Street 
and Freddy Krueger, and it wouldn't bother me in the least. <laughs> I'm probably more scared of the Count from Sesame Street. That's how, that's how scared I am of horror films and anything scary. Bye, everybody. Bye. Buy some football.